today we're so very blessed that you hear us pray uh, nearly every service for our missionaries. And uh, we are a blessed people if you haven't figured it out yet. And one of the reasons why we're blessed is because um, God has sent out from our church or using our church to be a covering to missionaries that are really making a difference in the world today. One of the missionaries uh, that uh, we have been uh, her uh, home church and covering is Mary Beth Mayfield, who is, serves with Youth with a Mission in El Paso and Juarez. Um, she is the director of that mission base. I've known her for a number of years and have watched this uh, lady just blossom in her leadership and, and what they're doing in El Paso and Juarez is simply amazing. And uh, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna take time away from her message because in her message, she's incorporated also the testimony of what God is doing uh, through her work there. And so I wanna ask you to open up your hearts and hear the word of the Lord and receive to our pulpit, Mary Beth Myfield. Would you welcome her? I gotta give you a microphone. I think we have it. Good morning. It's good to be home this morning. We're going to start off by looking at Exodus 18, 13 through 26. The next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around from morning till evening. Moses replied, because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me, and I'm the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me, and let me give you a word of advice, and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. So show them how to conduct their lives. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 150, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures and all these people will go home in peace. Moses listened to his father-in-law's advice and followed his suggestions. He chose capable men from all over Israel and appointed them as leaders over the people. He put them in charge of groups of 1,150 and 10. These men were always available to solve the people's common disputes. They brought the major cases to Moses, but they took care of the smaller matters themselves. Um, For the last several weeks, God's been speaking to me from this scripture. And I think the question that Jethro asked Moses is a great one. What are you really accomplishing here? Moses obviously thought he was doing a good job. He was handing down rulings from God, mediating disputes, teaching the people God's decrees, and bringing God's uh, word to them. And for all purposes, he was God's man of the hour. Moses was the one God gave the Ten Commandments to, and he was the one who led the people through the Red Sea on dry ground and out of Egypt. Of course, he could handle a few disputes and teachings. But Moses' mistake was one that's common to all of us. He failed to recognize the season of his leadership, or we might say he failed to recognize the season of his life. 
Each season brings new challenges, new rewards, and leaders must, must have or develop the skills that they need for the new leadership focus of that season, just like we must each develop what we need for each new season of our lives. During the Exodus, Moses was front and center, and he needed to be. God was working through him with the help of Aaron and Miriam. He was firmly in charge, and there was no time to get a committee together to help make decisions. But now they were in the desert, and God was directing them to stay in certain places for varying times. There was time for Moses to develop leaders, but he didn't do it. He was still in crisis management or pioneering mode. And even though they weren't in the promised land yet, the people were settling into a routine. They were starting to live their everyday lives again, which is probably why there were so many disputes. Right? Because when you're, when you're running for your life from the Egyptians, you don't quarrel over little things. But when you have time to think about what your neighbor did to you and how their tent doesn't smell very good, then, you can di- then there's lots of disputes. The season was changing, and Moses was not changing with the season. Each of us must assess where we are in our lives, in our jobs, and in our leadership, and we must ensure that we're recognizing the season we're in and the one we're going into and equipping ourselves for it. I've really been thinking about seasons lately. A season can be defined as a limited time or opportunity to reach a goal and fulfill a purpose. And there's no set time for a season. As Christians, we can look at a season as a divinely preset period of time to accomplish the Lord's specific purposes. That definition really resounds with me. And as I look back on my 11 years of leading YWAM El Paso Juarez, I clearly can see five seasons that we've walked through. I want to take you through the five seasons, and maybe God will use what we've walked through to show you some of the things you've walked through. Because of season is a window of opportunity to embrace what God has for us and accomplish his will, we must understand that if we miss something in that season, it may never be regained again. So we want to pay attention to what God's doing and get all he has for us. The first season I want to talk about is the transition. I became, I became the director of YWAM El Paso Juarez in 2004, and my first year was the transition. I was blessed because I'd been part of the ministry already for seven years, so I wasn't taking on anything new. I was also blessed because, unlike most transitions, we lost no staff during that time. In fact, it was probably 18 full months before anyone transitioned on to anything else. What a blessing. But the first year was still rough, nonetheless. When I was prayed for to be commissioned um, at a conference that Pastor Nick was at, I had just buried my birth mother. I I met her. I was adopted, and I met her in my 20s. And um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, And I received the news that my home church had closed, and I had lost all my support. Because of that, I was moving out of the house I was renting. (laughs) But it wasn't all bad news because that's when God spoke to Pastor Nick that the church should adopt me as one of their home missionaries. So that was good news. The first year of leadership kept me challenged. And I remember at the end of that year, I told God I was finally comfortable in my skin again. I knew that I was right where I was supposed to be, doing God's will, and it was a great place to be. Are you in a time of transition? Are you trusting God step by step to bring you into the new season you're entering, either in your personal life, your work, your ministry, in this church? Are you equipping yourself for the new season, or are you going into it kicking and screaming and dragging your heels? Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Let me encourage you to run to him and let him show you how to transition with his grace. Don't we all need his grace? I need a a double portion of his grace. We should seek him for his purposes for our new season and discover his plans in the midst of it. Embracing the new, discovering your purpose, and resting in the center of his will will definitely help you transition well. The next season that I want to talk about I call the storm. In 2005, the year after the transition, 
The next season began, began with Hurricane Katrina. It ravaged the city of New Orleans when the levees broke the day after the storm hit. The water filled the city like, a, like water would fill a bowl. I'm from New Orleans, and my mom and brother would still live there. In fact, they didn't even want to evacuate. I talked to them the Saturday before the storm, and they, they yelled at me and told me I didn't know what I was talking about and that I just was scared of hurricanes now because I had gone through Andrew in Miami. Um, and so they were like, we're not going anywhere, until they saw the Doppler radar of the storm the next morning. They called me at 5 a.m. Mary, this is mother. We're leaving. <laughs> and, um, and they got out, thankfully. To say it was a difficult time would be an underestimation. The ministry was thriving and busy. Things were going on, and yet I was being pulled toward the city that I grew up in. I was teaching in one of our schools, a discipleship training school, and um, that's a six-month school that trains young people, or anyone really, um, gets them to know more about God, and, and um, he, he becomes more real in their lives. It's also the first school that we have to do to join YWAM. But I was teaching about faith that week, and then the storm hit. And I kept going back to how important it is to know the nature and character of God when we don't understand um, what he's doing around us, and when we don't understand what's happening to the people that we love. We have to know him and trust him in all circumstances, and knowing who he is is the way we do that. My mother's house, which I saw a few minutes ago, it should be slide seven, um, is, it had seven and a half feet of water in it for three weeks. Thankfully, as you can see, it's a raised duplex, and the upstairs where she lived was untouched. Everything downstairs had to be thrown away on both sides. My brother's house was untouched, but he and his family decided to stay in Virginia where they evacuated to, and so um, they had to move all of their things. I went to the city for a week with some very, very loyal friends, and we cleaned out the whole downstairs. And you can't see it, but the house is 100 feet long. So lots of downstairs. <laughs> the house is only 25 feet wide, but <laughs> 100 feet long. And so we cleaned out everything downstairs and uh, threw it all away. And then we went to my brother's house and we packed his whole house up so that they could move. A month later, I met the DTS team that I'd been teaching in their school, and they came down and we all worked in the city gutting houses, ministering to people, taking out lots of refrigerators. That was like the big job of the hour, right? Because everyone's refrigerator had sat for six, three to six weeks without electricity. You can imagine, I won't give you the visual, <laughs> but ministering in the city was wonderful and getting to help the people that I loved. Um, it, it was amazing to drive through the streets because I knew people in my neighborhood, every block, I knew the families and how they were affected, and it was quite, quite dramatic. The season of the storm brought a lot of change and required a lot of flexibility. A month after the storm, my mother moved in with me. That required adjustment. I hadn't lived, <laughs> yeah, hadn't lived with my mother, and you can go on to the next slide. I hadn't lived with my mother and for 30 years. And in a way, um, I think the storm really prepared us for the next season we had to walk through. What storm are you walking through currently? Have you allowed the Lord to shelter you in the storm? Or are you there with your umbrella turning inside out trying to do it on your own? It's kind of a picture of me sometimes. I don't know about you. <laughs> but from the season of the storm, I learned the importance of really knowing God's character and trusting him even when I don't understand the things happening. And there's so many types of storms raging around us right now. If we allowed ourselves to, we could stay in a constant state of worry. When we think about ISIS, the economy, the war on terror, social security, or insecurity, as a friend of mine calls it, health issues, financial problems, you name it, we could be consumed by the storms of life if we allowed ourselves to be, because there are more than enough storms to worry about. But Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let's all of us stay in the center of his will and in his peace 
and allow the storms to rage around us but not consume us. Before I tell you about the next season, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the ministry of YWAM El Paso Juarez. The next season was long and difficult, and understanding who we are and what kind of ministry we do, we do will help understand the impact of this next season. The ministry was started by a team. You can go on, I think, two more, two more slides. The ministry was started by a team out of YWAM Tyler in 1981, 34 years ago, and the heart to go and serve other ministries uh, was what they wanted to do. They just wanted to go, and they wanted to go and serve others, and so that's what they did. And then in the process of doing that, God showed them what their ministry should be. For the first two years, that's what they did, and God showed them one of the ministries that they wanted them to be involved with was a children's home in the middle of the desert. It was named Rancho de los Amigos, a ranch of the friends, and the friends were the people that gave the money to start the ranch. Rancho was started in 1960, and after our team had been there serving for two years, the board asked us to take on the ministry of the the oversight of the home. In 1983, or 32 years ago, Wyoming El Paso Juarez took on Rancho and renamed it Rancho Los Amigos, our friend's ranch. The goal of Rancho Los Amigos is to reach, raise, and restore the hurting children of Mexico. The home provides a safe environment, healthy meals, medical and dental care, and a good Christian character-based education. They also work to grow the children spiritually with the goal that they would each surrender their lives to the Lord. Having the children's home is a rich part of our ministry. We've seen God do amazing things in the lives of the children. We've come into a season where the girls of the home especially have embraced their educational opportunities and have been excelling. And I'd like to brag on our girls for a minute. Is that all right? If you can back up to slide 12, that would be great. And it'll be the first one of the girls. There we go. That's Brenda. Brenda grew up in the home from the age of three. She was the first one to finish high school, do her discipleship training school. And she did that in Australia. And then go to college. Last December, she graduated from college with a Bachelor of Arts in Communication organizational and corporate communication with a minor in translation and interpretation. And now she's pursuing her Master of Arts in communication. Brenda has set a new standard for the children of the home, and they are following her, and we're so excited. The next girl in the nursing outfit is Gabby. Gabby spent 12 years with us. She graduated high school, did her DTS in Hong Kong, and then returned to pursue a nursing degree in Guadalajara, Mexico. She'll graduate from nursing this December, and we're so, so proud of her. Um, Her sister, Liseth, is the next slide. Um, She was with us for 13 years, and she did her DTS with YWAM ships out of Kona, Hawaii. Yes, a girl from the desert went to Hawaii and works on the water. And of course, after she went there, she doesn't want to come home, right? (laughs) Afterwards, she returned to do the Bible Core course and then joined the staff of YWAM Ships. She's their registrar. She loves working in the office, and she also loves working with the Discipleship Training School, which she's doing right now. In the last few months, she also just got engaged to a lovely young man that's a Christian. Uh, Jackie came to us when she was 10 years old, and she had never been in school, and that's not uncommon. She worked hard, and she finished junior high school, but she... Um, when she went to go into her high school class, they canceled the class for lack of students. She was determined to keep studying, though, and she really wanted to become a hairdresser and do nails and hair and color. So she found a program. She finished it in a year, and she's gotten her certification in both the U.S. and Mexico to do cosmetology. We're very proud of her. After that, she did her DTS with YWAM Ships, and now she's back on our staff working full-time with the DTS. The next one is Jasmine. She was with us for 14 years and graduated high school in a self-study program. It only took her two years to finish high school because she's very motivated. And what you need to know about all these kids also is they're bilingual. We raise them all bilingual. So she reads as much English as she does Spanish, and she did her high school in in English, actually. Um, She graduated last May, and now she attended a DTS in Brazil and she's planning to do a two-year associate's course to learn how to be a photojournalist. And yes, I know your questions. How can you afford to put all these kids through college? We can't. Thank God it's God's bill. 
<laughs> and we help them raise money, and we help them whatever they need to do to, to do it, and God has been very, very faithful. We do have a higher education fund. If anyone would like to contribute, we are always taking donations for that. And then on Friday, I just went to Eveth's DTS graduation in Orlando. That would be the next slide. She has a severe learning disability but worked hard and finished junior high. She went to Austria for a year and worked as a nanny for the daughter of our children's home director. And that really helped her mature and grow up and helped her English a lot. She returned, and then she felt like God wanted her to do the DTS. Um, now she just went home yesterday, and she wants to work at restoring relationships with her birth family and telling them about Jesus. She's actually the youngest of nine children, and um, we had the last four in our home, and she's the, the youngest of all of them. And then she wants to go back to Orlando next spring to do the School of Ministry Development. We believe that education breaks cycles of violence, abuse, poverty, and addiction. And that's why we're so committed to see these kids get as much education as they can. We see the change a good education is making in the lives of the girls, but unfortunately, our boys are not getting it. Would you pray for our boys? Our teenage boys decide that they're men and they want to get out of a children's home. They don't like being with all the kids. And we're really praying and working on different ways that we can... Uh, continue to engage them so that they can take advantage of all of the educational opportunities that they have. In fact, I just finished my master's um, in leadership on this topic, how to engage institutionalized youth in Mexico with higher educational opportunities. And, and to be honest, came up with some really cool things that we're going to try. And we're going to keep trying until we have just as much success with the boys as we do with the girls. Um, speaking of school, we have a school on our campus also. It's called Colegio de las Naciones, and it's a school for elementary children. Right in the middle of the cartel wars, God told us to open a school, and so we did that. And it's a blessing to have our little ones on campus. We get to reinforce the character lessons. You can go to the next slide. Reinforce the character lessons and knowledge of God that we work to impart in the home. There, but there's so much more to our ministry than the children, than the children's home and the school. In the summer and fall, we run a program called Super Semana. It's, it's a super week uh, based around superheroes where we train 5 to 12-year-olds from our community to know and trust God. And that would be the next slide. It's like a VBS but with a missions focus. We usually have about 100 or 150 kids, and we get them more every day. The kids love coming to our program. In fact, there was a, um, some Jehovah's Witness visiting one of the kids' families, and uh, they were telling them their story of creation. And the little boy says, that's not what happened. <laughs> and they said, well, tell us what happened. And he told them the story of creation. And uh, they said, well, where did you learn that? He said, Super Samana, of course. Like, don't you know that? That's where they teach us all these things. And you're wrong. <laughs> then we also run um, our DTS, our training school, that you can go on to the next slide. Um, it's done bilingually in English and Spanish. We have the largest one running right now. We're really excited about that, that we've had in a while. We also run a Bible school for the nations, or BSN. It's a six-month Bible school that's focused on how to teach the Bible in different settings, especially cross-culturally. We also have a one-month intensive Spanish language school. Anybody want to learn Spanish? It's a great program, and I, I've seen people go in with no Spanish and come out being able to do a short, a short presentation in Spanish. So they really, it's just intense. Everyone speaks Spanish to them. They do a lot of activities in the city to use what they're learning, and it's a fun program, usually, usually around the summertime. Uh, I have information about that in the back also. Besides the children's home and the training schools, we also host teams. And I know you guys are going to be bringing a team out, so we're looking forward to that. We have youth teams and adult teams, professional teams and family teams coming to serve with us. We've restarted our house building ministry to provide a home of hope for hardworking families. And we host two medical outreaches a year in the spring and fall. We also host evangelism teams from Mexico, the U.S., and around the world. And most teams do a variety of types of ministry. We work in soup kitchens. We've helped plant a church. We do Bible distribution in our community. And in fact, we're doing it very methodically, starting from where we are and hoping to cover the whole city with Bibles. 
Another ministry that we have that we've had for about two years is called Calles, which in Spanish means streets. But in English, it stands for compassion, love, liberty, freedom, hope, and health. And it's a ministry to the prostitutes in downtown Juarez. The girls that started this ministry prayed for years and felt like God was telling them that they, that he wanted them to go and work with these women, whether they were trafficked or not, and just get to know them and through relationship. And that's what they do. They go down and share a Coke or paint their nails or do something. And um, I think it's the next slide that shows a block party that we did with them, I think. There you go. And... Um, it was really neat. We, we, we got all of the permits we needed. We set up a whole block right in the city center, and we had food and all kind of things going on. And the men that were with us went out and gave roses to all the women and invited them to come because Jesus loved them. And they came, and that we fed them, and we had music, and we did their nails and cut their hair and prayed with them, and it was just a wonderful thing. We're having another one on September 4th. Now that you have a better picture of the whole ministry, I want to talk to you about the next season because it was a long one and a hard one, and I call it the war. In 2008, the cartel wars came into Juarez. The murder rate skyrocketed. In 2007, we had 300 murders a year, or less than a murder a day. And by 2010, three years later, we had 3,622 murders a year, which was 10 murders a day in our city. At the beginning of that time, there was a perfect storm that really increased the decline of teams and people coming to minister with us. The cartel wars were started, the economy downturn in the U.S., and the swine flu outbreak. All three of those things happened in the fall of 2008, and every team that was coming canceled. Most of our teams... Um, did not want to be in the middle of all of that. We did have one medical team that came, but uh, when a guy came in with a bullet wound, we decided we shouldn't do medical outreaches anymore, (laughs) not for the time being. (laughs) Um, We had also just restarted our home building ministry, and then we had no people to build the homes. We tried to go about normal everyday life as much as we could, but nothing was normal. There were even a few students that were applying to our schools, but when they found out where we were, they canceled. We tried to keep the lives of our kids as normal as possible, but every time we took them out, we found that we would have to say, look on this side of the van, because of something gruesome that was happening over here. We saw people that had just been murdered. They hung them from the bridges. We heard bullet um, gunshots all the time. Bodies were dumped in our community. Four policemen were ambushed right across our wall one day when all the kids were outside playing. It was it was a very difficult time, but praise God, He protected us. We because of the decrease in finances, we actually did things like close buildings and and we just hunkered down in prayer. It was an incredible season. Thankfully the ministry had no debt because we do everything by cash. So everything we build all the vehicles, everything we buy, we do on a cash basis. And that's what kept us going during those years because we could close buildings and we could do whatever we needed to to just pay the monthly, the monthly bills. God really blessed us during that time. We saw many other ministries leave because of fear or close down because of finances. But the, even though the violence came very close to us, God protected us. By 2012, the murder rate was down to 797 or two per day. And in the month of March for this year, we hit a seven-year low with only 22 murders. That puts us under the 2007 rate. We praise God for his deliverance. We praise God for his protection. And many people ask me what happened to end the cartel wars. I can tell you it was three things. The biggest thing was prayer. We saw international prayer raised up for our city like never before. Juarez had been named the murder capital of the world, with more deaths happening in our city than happened in any war zone around the world. It was easier to to get killed in Juarez than it was to get killed in Afghanistan or or Iran or Iraq. Um, People were praying, praying, praying. We prayed. We went to prayer meetings. The city gathered together. It was an amazing time of prayer. At the same time, the police chief that was in Tijuana 
and had cleaned up Tijuana, came, and he did an incredible, incredible job in our city. And in the end, one of the cartels won. They won the drug routes through, the, through our region. Many people told us, you were so brave for staying. We can't believe that you and your whole staff, our whole staff stayed. We all prayed about whether we were supposed to be there, and every person on our staff, even the ones with little kids and families, we all felt God told us to stay. And to be honest, we weren't brave. We were not brave. We were simply obedient to stay where the Lord had called us, even with a war raging around us. The only way we could do that was to stay close to Jesus, to seek his face regularly, to know his heart, and then when we had done everything else, to stand. Ephesians six thirteen and 14 talks about that in terms of spiritual warfare. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. And that's what we did. We stood. We waited. And we saw the Lord's deliverance. Are you fighting a war right now in your own life? Or are you likely to become collateral damage from a, war, from a war raging around you in your home, your family, your work, or your ministry? I just want to encourage you to stay close to Jesus, to seek his face, to know his heart, and to stand your ground. And when you've done everything that you can, and you don't have any energy left to say another prayer, just stand. <coughs> the next season, I call it the home. And it actually overlapped with the war. For years, our heart and desire was to build a new home for the children of Rancho Los Amigos. The current home um, is the next slide. Uh, it's an old adobe structure that's literally melting away, and the roof is unrepairable. We've tried many times, even recently, with repairing the roof. And just last week, we had enough rain. Nothing like your rain, though. We get 6 to 12 inches a year. <laughs> but it was, we get enough rain at one time. It's like monsoon rain, and the ground's so dry that it can't absorb it, and so it, it floods. Um, our boys' dorm flooded twice last week. R- rain coming through the roof and rain coming through the walls. Our walls are literally melting away. At the height of the cartel war, we, be, we felt like the God told us to go ahead and start fundraising for the new home. But you need to understand, we were trying to keep a low profile, stay under the radar, not look like we had money. We didn't want anyone to think they needed to come rob us because we didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> um, so we really wondered if God's timing was right, but we, you know, starting a major project like that would definitely draw some attention. But we were so certain the direction was him that we did it. We raised the money, and we were able to do all the infrastructure, which is the underground kind of stuff, during the worst part of the cartel war. And as soon as the murder rate dropped, we were ready to do vertical construction. Several of you know about the project and have actually given, it, given to it. Thank you very much. We're building the new home on a cash-only basis. And we've had everything we've need to keep the work going. We've raised over $2 million. The total project was $2.5 million. This week, though, might be the first time that we have to tell the workers this is our last week because we're out of money. And we've been praying, we've been calling, we've been doing everything we knew to do, and now we have to stand and wait on God's provision. Will you pray for us? That God shows us if there's anything else we need to do so that we can see the release of the last 20% of the project or $557,000. Our desire is to stand firm in the knowledge of him, that he's the provider, that he's a good God, that this is his project. And we just want to wait on his timing. What do you believe in God for right now? I'm trusting him for $557,000. Doesn't that make what you're trusting him for seem a little bit small? I hope so. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Are you in the scary season where, on a daily basis, you're just looking to him and his provision? Are you trusting him to do the seemingly impossible? Are doubts creeping in? Then you can join us as we pray from Mark 9, 24. Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Because... In human terms, it looks impossible. But with God, nothing's impossible. 
Are we waiting on him, or are we trying to figure out how to do it on our own? You know, that's been a real temptation, especially feeling like the one responsible for the whole project. Okay, God, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? And he's showing me, nope, just wait. Just wait. And then when it happens, what happens? We can give him all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. The fifth and final season that I want to talk about is the release. God spoke to us about the release during the war, but it was really hard for us to imagine. We took it on faith as he kept speaking to us over and over in different ways. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Things are not always going to be like this. We felt strongly that God would release to us more children in the home, more children in the school, and even get some attending the school from the community. He was going to give us more teams in all categories, more houses to build, more people to see, more medical outreaches to to staff, and more students in our schools. As we prepared and prayed, we had a real excitement for what God was about to do, and we actually even built dorms. And as soon as they were finished, God started to, to fill them. It was so hard to imagine during the cartel wars that this was even a possibility, but as we stood and waited on him, We've seen God do amazing things over the last three years. Teams have returned. We're holding more medical outreaches again twice a year and building homes for the poor. We have the largest DTS that we've had in seven years. We're seeing great breakthroughs in the lives of our children and getting a handle on how to help the teenage boys. I've also seen a personal release during the season. My mom, Beth, is 87 years old, and I've prayed for her salvation for 28 years. This year on Easter Sunday, which that's a picture of, my mom surrendered her heart to Jesus and proudly announced it to me when we got home. Mary Beth, do you know what I did today? I said, well, no, Mom, what did you do? I surrendered my life to Jesus. And I was so shocked. I was like, that, that's great. And I didn't really say too much. But then later, God's like, uh, excuse me, you've been praying for this for 28 years, and why aren't you doing the happy dance? And that's when I realized this must be real. This isn't just her praying a prayer again. This isn't just her saying, yeah, yeah, I know. It was that something really changed. So the next morning I had a conversation with her at the, at the breakfast table, and I explained to her what it meant and how excited I was, and, and she wanted to know what I meant when I said that I heard from God, so I talked to her about hearing the voice of God in prayer, and, and she just has had so many questions. Just this last week, I gave her a discipleship book. She read, like, the whole book. It's supposed to be, you know, you do a little bit every day, and you write in it. Oh, no, she doesn't want to write, but she just read almost the whole book. And I came home, and she said, do you know what kind of Christian I want to be? I said, no, Mom, what kind? She goes, I want to be a spiritual Christian. I don't want to be those other kind. I said, well, what other kind are they, Mom? I said, was one of them carnal Christian? No, I don't think so. She goes, there were two other kinds. I said, well, let's look it up. So we looked it up in her book. And sure enough, it was either carnal Christian or spiritual Christian. She goes, I want to be a spiritual Christian because I want the Holy Spirit to lead me. I said, that's great, Mom. And I'm thinking, who are you and what have you done with my mother? (laughs) Praise God, right? She's definitely a new creation, and I can see God changing her every day. It is amazing. And she's challenging me, and isn't that the way it should be? So what will come after the release for the ministry and for me personally? I have a sense that we're about to move into that now. What will mark this new season? I don't really know. Will God birth new ministries so that we can more effectively reach the people in our community? Maybe so. Will he have to prune some of what we do so that new growth can form? It's possible, and that could be painful. Our leadership team prays and asks God on a regular basis, Are we doing what you want us to do? What do we need to prepare for? What's next? And that's really important. And what will it mean for me? I don't know that either. I just finished working on my Master's of Arts in Leadership and will be graduating next month. And that will mark the end of a personal season for me of study. I also hope that the new home's finished soon, so that marks the end of that season. And what will this new season be called? I don't know that either. (laughs) But what I do know is whatever it brings, I want to make sure that we go through it with joy in the journey. What will your next season look like? Are you poised and ready? Are we in the habit of saying yes to God before he asks us? That's a little scary. 
if our answer to him is always yes. And then he brings something up and you're going, no, no, what what do you mean, God? I did that once, the only time I'll ever do it. I was driving on my way to church, just gotten a bonus from my job at Burger King Corporation, and I was arguing with God about tithing on it. Because I, I just had all kind of reasons why I shouldn't have to. And God, I have all these bills and this would take care of that. And this is your provision for me. And I know. And so I'm driving on my way to church and I'm just arguing with God. Well, I miss the church. And there's no stop sign before the church, but there's a stop sign quickly after the church at a major intersection. And I flew past my church in my little red BMW that I won from work because I was one of the top managers of the year. Flew past there, got to the intersection, saw the stop sign at the last minute, slammed on my brakes, went through the intersection sideways, and I was looking right at a police car that was coming right at me and nearly hit me. Pulled over when I got on the other side and stopped and just sat there with my heart beating and with me saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, God, I'm so sorry, I'll never fight with you again, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I was waiting for the policeman to come and give me the ticket of my life. God must have put blinders on his eyes because he didn't even see me. He didn't stop. He nearly hit me, and he didn't stop. That was the last time that I will ever argue with God, especially about money. Now I try to say yes to him before he asks. We need to all be that way. We need to say yes to him, do whatever he asks of us in the future, and know that because he's love. The only thing he's going to ask us to do is something that's loving for us and loving for those around us. So I want to reiterate Jethro's question. What are you really accomplishing here? Moses was wise enough to take Jethro's advice post-haste. He recognized that the season of his leadership had changed, and he now had to adapt. He chose capable men from all over the camp, appointed them as leaders, and put them in charge, some of small groups, some of large. He began the process of recognizing his new season— and what his new focus should be. Moses had Jethro to speak into his life. Pray and ask God if you're in a new season that you've not recognized. Ask him who your Jethro is, and pray with them and listen. Move into your next season with confidence that the Lord's already there waiting for you, and knowing that he's the same faithful and loving God that he's always been. Trust him and embrace joy in your journey. I hope that you guys got a taste today of what our ministry is about, got to know me a little bit, for those of you that I've never met before. I'm so blessed with being a missionary at New Hope Church. Thank you. I know God's provided for me through all of you. But what I want you to know is that every testimony that I share, every good thing that God's doing through our ministry, every prostitute that's ministered to, child that's raised, student that's taught, is part of your testimony. Because your support of our ministry, you're doing the work of God. We get to be there full time, and that's a huge blessing for us. But you get to be part of everything we're doing there. And so, um, yeah, thank you. And thank you for your prayers. You're a praying church, and those make a difference. At the end of the service today, I have a little table out there. I brought lots of different information about the ministry. I have... Magazines about the children's home, magazines about the ministry. Uh, We also have pictures of the kids with sponsorship envelopes. Even if you can't sponsor a child, would you take one and pray for them? That would really be great. And then you can pick up some of the other things. If you take everything off of my table, I'll be so happy because my suitcase will be lighter to go home, and then I can fit Eveth's sleeping bag in the suitcase. So I could really use that help. Thank you guys so much, and God bless you. Well, are you as blessed as me? I I am just so amazed at what the Lord is doing through the people that God has sent out from our church. And it is our great privilege to be the home church, the sending church of Mary Beth and the others that we send out and others that we will soon adopt uh, as as God guides and directs us. Um, Every time you give in the church, a portion of what you give goes to support Mary Beth and our three other missionaries. Our church practices the principle of tithing. We take the first tenth 
of everything that comes in the general offering of the church, and we set that aside and we send it into the foreign mission field through our missionaries. And then we encourage people uh, to give directly to missions with a monthly mission pledge. Uh, Anytime you give a, a check and it says mission on it, then it goes into the mission fund that helps support our missionaries. And our goal is to continue to support them in the fashion that we have, uh, increase it as God gives us the ability and take on some other missionaries that um, I know have need and we would love to begin to support. Uh, In the first weekend of October, we will have our mission conference weekend and that's where we'll present to you um, our goals for the following year and the support budget and what we hope to raise and who we want to continue to support. Um, But it is our privilege and our blessing uh, to support you, Mary Beth, and I'm grateful that uh, you call New Hope your home. Let's, um, let's open up our hearts to the Lord. I believe that God is doing a new thing. As a matter of fact, as Mary Beth was speaking, there were a couple of passages in Isaiah that came to my heart. One of them was Isaiah 43. It's something that the Lord has spoken to me often, but it says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. And we could just pause there and think for a minute. Uh, some of you are living life looking at the rearview mirror, and you'll never move forward if you keep dwelling on the past. There's some stuff you just got to let go of. There are some things you just have to accept. They're not going to change. God, it's just not going to happen. You just forget the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. God's doing a new thing here at New Hope, and I'm excited about what he is doing. And then, Mary Beth, before you scoot out, I just want to say to you that uh, while you were saying you don't know what the next season's going to be, the Lord quickened a verse uh, that I want to share with you, and you just take it, and if this is for you, it's for you. But Isaiah 62, verse 4 says this, no longer will they call you deserted or, your, or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. Hephzibah means my delight is in her and Beulah means married. Amen. Amen. Let's open up our hearts. Um, We, as always, when we have a missionary or a guest speaker, uh, we have the opportunity to sow seed into their ministry. And uh, that is our opportunity today. Please don't ever get mad at me for taking too many offerings. Uh, Your problem really isn't with me, it's with God. Um, Here's what I do encourage you to do. All you do is just, Everything that you have belongs to the Lord. And so just simply ask the Lord what he wants you to do. And he may say, I want you to sow a seed. Or he may say, no, I want you to hold what you have now because down the road, there's something coming and I want you to sow into that. So you just obey whatever God speaks to your heart, but have the courage at least to ask. And we'll do that right now. Father, we thank you for Mary Beth. We thank you, God, for the gift that she is to our church and to the nations, Lord. And we thank you for the amazing things that you have done in her and through her and what you are taking her through. And I pray, Lord God, that you would bring bounty and blessing to her. You would increase, Lord God, uh, the, uh, the ability for her to do what you've called her to do. You would pour out blessing and add blessing to the blessing, Lord. Father, even now, God, you've given us an opportunity to be a partaker in that ministry. And Lord, I ask you, what would you have us to do? Lord, what would you have me to do? Speak to my heart now, Lord. Lord, give me the courage to obey what you've spoken to my heart. Thank you again for your amazing and great grace. Glorify your name through our giving, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you are... um, If you're making out a check, please make it payable to New Hope Church. 
and everything in this offering will go to Mary Beth and we always add a little bit more. Uh, we don't take out expenses or anything. Uh, we trust God to meet our needs and we uh, wanna bless our missionaries and our guests that come. Amen? It's been a good day, hasn't it? Have you been blessed? If you haven't been blessed, come on back up here. We'll pray for you and get your blesser fixed because your blesser's broke if you haven't been blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once you have been served, you may be dismissed. Father, I thank you, God, for your grace upon your people. I pray the blessing of God, the peace of God, the grace of God go with you. I pray that everywhere you go, you would take it for the kingdom of God. I pray that the Lord would give you words to speak to people who don't know him, and those words would bring life to those people. I pray that God would use you to touch people, to bring healing and restoration in their lives. I pray that you would become agents of grace everywhere you go, and that the great God story in your life would be told to many, and many would come to know Jesus because you have been faithful to share. Glorify the name of the Lord as you leave this house in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace till we gather again. Amen.